Hey guys, welcome back to the Dad Tired Podcast. Today we are continuing our series on what it looks like to be a spiritual leader in your home really practically. This is part two of a two-part series. So if you missed last week, definitely recommend that you go back and download that and listen to that one before you jump into today's episode. Also, if you listened to last week's episode and you listened to today's episode and you're like, man, this is really good. I feel encouraged, but I just need more. Like I, I just need somebody to like give me some really, really practical stuff on how to lead my family to Jesus. We have those tools. We have the, what's called the Family Leadership Program. This is a four-week course where you go through with a group of guys. They're going to be course guys paired up with you and some other guys in your cohort who are really going to challenge you and push you towards daily practical steps in leading your family well. Week one, we're going to just talk about you, what it looks like for you as a man to love Jesus. Week two, we're going to talk about what does it look like for you as a husband to lead your wife toward Jesus. Week three, we're going to talk about what does it look like for you to lead your kids toward Jesus. And then lastly, in week four, we're going to talk about what does it look like to be on mission at work, to see the gospel transform the way you think about work. And then after those four weeks, you're still part of the program. You'll jump into the monthly live trainings. You'll stay connected with your cohort and your course guides and everyone else that's part of the program. So there's a continuation of the program even after the four weeks. But the first four weeks are intense. Like you you commit to, I'd say, realistically 10 to 30 minutes a day to get after the homework. There's daily Bible reading plans. There's an assignment for you to watch. And then there's some homework to do. And then there's some stuff to process with your course guides. You can go at, you know, at your own pace. So if you want to take those four weeks and spread them out over four months or four years, that's totally up to you. But anyway, I just tell you that because I know a lot of guys are like, you listen to the podcast and you love it and, and it's helpful for you and encouraging to you. But you're just like, man, I, I just need some like really, really pra- like tell me what to do day one. Tell me what to do day two, <laughs> that kind of thing. So if that's you and you feel like you just you're ready to have some more practical tools, we would love to have you join that program. Once you jump in, if you were to sign up today, you would jump in on the first of the next month. So whatever you start the first of every month is how that's, that works. And we have a small group, your cohort that you go through every month with those group of guys. Anyway, if you have any questions on that, hit us up and let us know. We, we'd be happy to answer those for you. If you're ready to dive in, you can go to dadtire.com forward slash lead, L-E-A-D, lead, and uh, start leading your family well today. Anyway, with all that said, let's dive into week two of what it looks like to lead our family well when it comes to spiritual leadership. So last time we talked about the attitude of spiritual leadership and some of the myths that kind of surround it, that to be a spiritual leader of your household, you should be waking up every morning before dawn and making sure that you're exegeting the original Greek at all times and that all of your kids have a homeschool education in the original Latin, you know, like all these just kind of crazy stuff. And without a proper guideline or without a kind of a cannon or a measuring stick, we don't really know how we're doing sometimes in this category. And so I want to A, simplify it for us by using scripture and B, not oversimplify it or make it so easy that we're kind of let off the hook with what we're called to be as fathers and as husbands. And so what does spiritual leadership look like? And so last week we talked about the attitude of a spiritual leader. We we looked at Philippians chapter two and what Jesus considered to be a proper attitude of leadership. We talked about kenosis leadership, about birthday, birthday expectations, the difficulty of being a husband and a father and what that means for all of us. And today we're going to look at what are some of those actions? What are ways that we are able to in kind of categorically look at our life and say, how am I practicing the work of spiritual leadership in my household? And what are some of those tips that I could walk away with or simple things I could put into practice? Maybe you're you're new to faith or you're new to caring about that you are the spiritual leader of your household and, and you really want to dive into what that looks like better. If you want to turn with me, once again, we always want to ground what we say in Scripture so that it doesn't become a self-help book or the gospel according to Chris, but instead what the Scriptures tell us. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in it is contained my favorite verse in the Bible, which is 2 Corinthians 5.21, which says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become his righteousness. But it's all, that's encapsulated in the context of a greater chapter. One of the most helpful things that you can ever have as a a spiritual leader of your family is when you go to read scripture, or if you are doing a devotion or something else like that, I had a professor one time tell me, and it's, it's stuck with me ever since, never read a Bible verse. 
<laughs> which is kind of backwards because you think, wait, shouldn't you be telling me to read more Bible verses? But his point was read Bible paragraphs, read Bible sections, but don't read a Bible verse. A Bible verse without context is almost, you can make the Bible say almost anything you want. If you read Bible verses, you have a really hard time manipulating the text. If you read Bible paragraphs, Bible sections, or books of the Bible. So that's what we want to be able to do. So we start here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's what it says. Verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... The new creation has come. The old creation is gone. The new is here. All this is from God. Okay, so it's saying, if you are in Christ, and that's again, that's a starting point for all conversations of spiritual leadership and leading our families. And maybe you're not a Jesus follower and you're listening to this. The Bible seems to indicate that the power that we have to lead our families spiritually, it's not that we can't mimic as non-believers what Jesus has called us to do. It's that the source by which and the spirit in which we're empowered to do these things comes exclusively through the the spirit of God in our life. So it's not that as non-believers we can't mimic these things. It's just out of the, the pureness of the spirit of God, we're not able to tap into the strength and the source of what gives us the power to do these things. So it says, therefore, it begins with, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Ipso facto, if you do those things in, in the negation, if anyone is not in Christ, they are not a new creation. They're part of the old self. The scripture talks about the old Adam, this old way of thinking. And again, all you can do then is mimic and mock what someone in Christ should do, but you won't actually be tapping into the power of the spirit in your life. All this is from God who reconciled, okay, that's the same word we would use for like fixing a relationship. So Genesis chapter three says there was a war between God and mankind. Because we committed treason against God, we were in our nature at war. We were enemies, Romans tells us, we were enemies with God. But chapter five of Romans says, Romans five or say, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we were enemies and then God reconciled us to himself by his death on the cross. He paid the price of the war that we started. And then in his resurrection, he promised us a newness of life in him that we're able to tap into now. We don't just experience heaven when we die. We get to start experiencing it now, not in the pain-free, suffering-free, grief-free life, but we get to tap into heaven now because we have Christ in us. And Christ in us is what we can expect for the rest of eternity. And John 17 says we have that now. So we look forward to the kingdom of God someday in its fullness, but right now we're still able to experience it because we're able to have God living inside of us. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us then the ministry of reconciliation. So as dads, we've been given the ministry, the ability, the the power and the spirit. We have it on call to be ministers of reconciliation. A minister is is someone who, who gives or who administrates or who executes reconciliation. Here it is, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. This is what God was doing. God used Jesus to make peace with the world. That's what that says. Instead of counting people's sins against them, instead of holding them culpable and accountable and judging them and punishing them for their sins, God held Jesus accountable and culpable and punished him for our sins. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation, not just the ministry of it, but also the message of it. We are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors. So Jesus came as an ambassador for the kingdom of God. He came and he made himself nothing, and he took the form of a servant, and he was executed and crucified to make reconciliation between God and mankind. And now God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, and we, like, that's what ambassador is, we, like Christ, are going to do the same thing with those that are around us. As fathers and as husbands, we are Christ's ambassadors. It's as if, the next verse says, as though God were making his appeal through us, as if we were walking into a foreign country as citizens of our home country, and we were extending reconciliation between our king and theirs, between our king and the citizens there, that we have a good, great king 
that all mankind has sinned against. And we as ministers of reconciliation, as ambassadors, we put on the robes of our home country. We put on the robes of righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we walk to the foreign countries. That's the sinners and the sinful people around us, including but not limited to our own family. We walk up to them as ambassadors of Christ. And we appeal to them on behalf of Jesus to be reconciled with Jesus. We implore you on Christ's behalf. The the cry of a father before anything else in your child's life should not be, God, give them a great wife, give them a great husband, give them a great job, give them a great career. It would be, Lord, use whatever necessary to turn their heart to you, whatever it is. If it comes through trial, through pain, through success, through joy, through anything, before they are a CEO, before they are an MVP, I want them to know you as father. And God, may I, as father, may I, as dad, not stand in the way of the great work you're doing in my kid to draw his heart towards you. May I be a minister of that? May I be helpful in that process? May I not miss the importance of G-O-D and instead replace that with MVP? May I care much more about his character in G-O-D than his G-P-A and his MVP? These are all important letters, but God is the most important. May I first and foremost see myself as a minister that wants God on behalf of Jesus to make peace between my son, between my daughter and their savior. If God, if you transform my kid into nothing else, if they achieve nothing, but they are found in you, my work as father will be complete. Everything else we do flows out of that. The reason that we discipline, the reason that we want them to go to a good school, the reason that we do all these things is that they would know Jesus. That's it. Imagine having a very successful, very profitable, very well-liked, respected member of the community that you bring up, but they don't know Jesus. That they could look forward to a life that was free from the suffering of poverty and that they would have a great acumen and that they would be well-known and that their voice would be persuasive in the community but that we knew at the end of their life that they would face judgment apart from God. Would any of us as fathers ever take that trade? We are first and foremost ambassadors for God, to be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. See, in there, I think it gives us a great idea of what are the actions of a spiritual leader. And it's that we are ambassadors. We ambassad, which is a verb to ambassad, which is a kind of a funny word, but it means that we properly represent. We are the ones in charge of demonstrating what it's like to be part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is invisible. Our job as dads is to make the invisible church, the invisible kingdom of God visible in our kid's life. So what does an ambassador do? How do we ambassad on behalf of God's kingdom for our kids? I broke this down into four things as we wrap up. This is super cheesy, but it's not as difficult as it may seem. S-E-A-M, which is not the way that you spell seem like this, but it's more like seem like a book or whatever. But Uh, Think of the word seem, S-E-A-M. It's a great way that I've used in my life to remember what does it mean to be Christ's ambassador as a father and as a husband. So S-E-A-M, we're going to kind of use this across stitch. I feel like I have to have simple things and kind of mnemonic devices in my life so that in the difficult parts of my day, I don't have to go and pull out my binder and figure out what this guy talked about, but instead I can just draw it to mind. So this was, this has been really helpful for me. When I'm at my best, when I'm ambassading for Christ's best, here's what I'm doing. Here's what 2 Corinthians is telling us to ambassad for Christ. Simply put, when Paul talks about it in the New Testament, he says, follow me as I follow Jesus. I really think that's the action of a spiritual leader. Follow me as I follow Jesus. Which is scary, because if our family's following us, and they're following us anywhere, they can also follow us into bad things. So we want to be well aware of what we're doing and how we're doing it. And the burden that we place on ourselves when we say the phrase to our family, follow me like I follow Jesus, Sometimes we'll hold us accountable and make sure that we are culpable to our actions and behavior and the things that we do. But the Bible doesn't say every day you need to get up at 530 and make sure you, you start your day in prayer. Every day you need to make sure that you are teasing out an old ancient hymn in its original languages. It, it, it doesn't say 
that we need to make sure that we're in Awanas eight times a week and that our kids are winning the Awanas trivia, Bible trivia championship. This is not what this, are the, can those be good things? I don't know about the Awanas championship. I don't know about any of that stuff, but can those be good things in our life? For sure. If that's what you feel like your calling is as Christ's ambassador, or if, or if that's the only way, that's the only discipline that you can think of to keep you on track with ambassadorship for Christ, then by all means do it. But the Bible does not implicate us on that. It doesn't talk about that. And it wouldn't make sense for a first century Jew who's reading this text to think like that because they wouldn't have access to a Bible personally. So the Bible can't mean that the only way, this is for wives too, if you're listening to this, that our husbands possibly can match up to what it means to be a spiritual leader is that we're having daily devotions and we're diving deep into what it, I, I tell you what, I'm a pastor and I take the word of God very, very, very seriously. And outside of a few times where it's fit into what we're doing, this is not what I'm doing. I'm not holding daily devotions with my family. Instead, I am modeling and ambassading for Christ's work in my life. And again, I never want to make the Bible say more than it says. I don't think that's important for us. This is what Jesus took issue with with the Pharisees. The Pharisees took the law, they took the simple commands of God, and they added fences around them, right? So if the Bible says don't dance, or the Bible says don't have premarital sex, the Pharisees would say, well, then don't dance, because dancing can lead to gyration, gyration can lead to lust, and lust can lead to premarital sex. Therefore, no dancing. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. So Jesus came and he tore down all those fences and he said, my law was good. My expectations were good. The way that I am asking you to lead your family is good. You don't need to make new rules and we don't need to hold people accountable to the rules that maybe your dad did that you now think this is what all men must do. This is really, I think, what we should hold them to. If you listen to the last one, do they have the attitude of Jesus that Philippians 2 talks about? Do they show meekness, power under control? Are they a humble man? And secondly, do they embass it in their actions? Do they show the work of Jesus in the way that they act? And here's the way that, here's the, here's the arguments I could probably make from scripture simply that show this is what it means to embass it and, and to act as a spiritual leader of our family. The first one, again, it's, it, the acronym you can use is SEAM, S-E-A-M. The first one is to seek gospel tunities. Gospel tunities are gospel opportunities in our families. Gospel tunity, a lot of the times as a father, is moments where our kids slip up or mess up. It can also be an opportunity. Let's say you're watching a movie that has some theme in it that goes against who Jesus is. Or maybe you're watching C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia and you can do the opposite. You can pause it and go, okay, Aslan, who had all the strength of a lion and all the power that comes and way more powerful than the white witch, why did he lay himself down on that altar humiliate himself and allow himself to be executed. Who deserved to be on that altar, right? Who deserved to be up there and why weren't they up there instead? And these are the ways that we can show gospel tunities. It's pointing conversations back to Jesus. And I think what Paul does it over and over again, and Jesus does the same thing. He's walking along in the desert and he comes upon a, a garden and he says, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who had some seeds. It, it, Jesus is constantly pointing his people towards gospel things. As a father, I would be remiss to let days go by without reminding my kids that the world that we see is not the way it seems. The achievements of this world are not primary. They are not prim. They are not the, the point. And so the moments I can take and see something in a movie that goes against what we believe as Christ followers, and I can pause the movie and say, guys, as for me and my household, here's what we believe concerning this. This is what Jesus calls us to, because we see this happen over and over again. We see Paul do it. We see Paul offer correction and admonition. We see Jesus do the same thing. He takes simple things. Every time he tells a parable, it's an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. He points conversations to heaven. How can I share the gospel right now? This is what it means to seek gospel tunities. When we're disciplining our kids, we want to align with the sin of their life and say, bud, I saw you hit your sister. And trust me, I know what it means to lose self-control. I do it all the time. I mess up all the time and God forgives me for it. And inside you, buddy, is the same power that is able to resist what you just did. But sometimes... In our flesh, we do what's contrary to our spirit. We do the wrong thing, even though we know what the right thing is. Didn't, isn't that what just happened? 
And though God loves you and God, God forgives you and I forgive you, we still have consequences for our actions. And that's why we're going to experience discipline right now. But I want you to know that you are loved, you are accepted, and you belong here. It's a gospel tunity. Seek gospel tunities. When we lead our family well, we seek those on a daily basis. The second one, E, S, is seek gospel tunity. Second is engage readily. The way that the Greeks described their gods was apatheia. They are gods who were apathetic, who were far off. I would guess if you look at modern fathers on television, you could describe them the same way. It's the Peter Griffins, the Homer Simpsons, the guys from modern TV or cartoons or King of the Hill or Bob's Burgers. These, these men are apathetic. They're not engaged. They see children as a burden. They, they're excited for nights out with the guys where they have no responsibility. And while those moments can be fun, we need to find deep meaning in engagement and not meaning in moments where we are free from engagement or free from responsibility. How do we engage readily? That means I'm, I'm aware and attentive of what my kids' needs are and what they're struggling with and what their attitudes are. And when they're disrespecting my wife, when they're disobeying, and when they're, and when they're being dishonest. Here's one thing that I've noticed when I talk to people. I, I do some like premarital counseling, and then I also get to do, I have the honor of getting to walk through some young families and do some workshops, some parenting workshops, some discipline workshops, and how to carry out discipline properly. Those are some of my favorite things to do. But I hear people say sometimes, I watched my kid do this, and I just ignored it because I didn't want to discipline them, as if the authority of discipline has been given to them as parents to decide whether or not they want to execute that discipline. And it's not. God has placed us as ambassadors. And when our kids break our laws, when they break the laws of our household, they're also breaking God's laws. And God hasn't given us permission to let things go. For sure, we can show mercy and explain grace and we can withhold punishment, but our kids better understand in those moments that that's what's happening. We can't be apatheia. We can't just see it from a distance and go, I'm not going to get off my butt and go, I just watched my son smack my daughter and he really shouldn't have done that. But if I pretend like I ignored it or if I pretend like I didn't see it, we're going to be fine. No, the, the, the Jesus follower that's leading their family will engage readily. They will be primed and ready to engage with the needs, wants, behaviors, disciplines, encouragement, admonition, warnings of their families. They're active participants in what's happening in the world around them. Seek gospel tunities, engage readily. The third one, and this is one that I think is missed a lot, to apologize often. As men, we need to be great, consistent, and ready apologizers. What does it mean to be a great apologizer? It, it means when we apologize, we use proper apology language. That means we don't say, I'm sorry you felt that way. I'm sorry you made me do this. I'm sorry if that hurt your feelings. I'm sorry, but I'm only human. I'm sorry, but everyone does it. I'm sorry, but this is just the way that it's going to be. That we apologize well and we apologize often, which means I acknowledge what I did wrong. I acknowledge that what I did wrong hurt you, and I acknowledge that I will do something different moving forward, that I ask for your forgiveness, and that I do what I need to to make the situation right insofar as I can. We apologize often. It, it even means apologizing to those teenagers that we're raising. It means apologizing to my seven-year-old at times. I, I did this the other day. He wanted to stay up late and play a game with dad, and that was like his big thing for the day, and he asked me 77,000 times that day if I remembered that we were going to play a game. And, and I have this dumb game that I love playing with my friends. And it's not a big deal. It's like $22 on Amazon. It's called Kings of Tokyo. And we just like to play it. And my son has been trying to play it with his friends, my, my seven-year-old. But he left the pieces out and a lot of them got like bent and damaged. And so he was waiting all day to have special time at night with his dad where we would play Kings of Tokyo together. And he got the game out and I saw some of the pieces were bent on a cardboard $22 game. Could I be a bigger child? That's neither here nor there. Don't answer that question. But I had, a, I just kind of had like a little hissy fit inside. I was a butt. I was like, Peyton, I told you if you're going to play this game, you need to take care of it. That's like, he's a seven. He's trying to impress his friends. I've got two other younger sons that are destructive, Leo and Brady, and they very well could have had a, play, a hand in it. But then I, I just... The whole rest of the time we were playing together, it's like I needed to, I needed to punish him 
for the fact that, but I did it just by being a little bit passive and I was already annoyed because I just done a full day of parenting and he had some moments even that day where he was disrespectful. And so I, it's like, I needed to show him in that moment that I was hurt and it's just embarrassing. And I hate that. I hate that I act like that. And so he went back upstairs after we played the game and I had to go back in his, I went and crawled in his bed with him and I just said, Hey man, I'm sorry. You got, you were excited to play that game. And I just acted like a child and I, I have to be better than that for you. And that's not who God's called me to be as your dad. And so I'm just hoping you would forgive me, bud. And, and if I could get a redo, maybe we could play that game again tomorrow night and I'm going to have a better attitude. And that is not who I want to be for you. And I'm sorry if that, if that kind of ruined our night together. And he apologized back. So oh, I'm just so sorry that I ruined your game. And, and it, it just kind of, it became this mutual moment of just deep bond but it was predicated on me taking my stupid pride, walking up those steps and just asking him for forgiveness. And I got to do that all the time. And I, I'll be in the car and I'll yell into the back seat not to ask my kids for forgiveness. And here's one thing that I've learned from talking to a lot of students. Okay. So I, I oversaw student ministries for 10 years at my church and it's a good sized student ministry, hundreds of, of students per year. And which means in the course of 10 years, you're talking about close to 10,000 students that have come in and out of the ministry at different times. And what I realized is that a lot of the students in this generation have been more affected by their parents' perfection than by their mistakes. I'll say that again. I I think a lot of the times our kids will be more marked negatively by our perceived perfection or our projected perfection than by our honest, repentant mistakes. The notion that they have perfect parents that never make mistakes is going to lead our kids to think that they are an anathema, that they are not worthy, that they are weird, that their desires and that their their selfishness is crazy. How many times do we walk in a, in, in a room where our kid is messed up and we say to them, how could you do this? Or if you just listen to me as adults, don't do the same thing all the time. We want to associate and go, man, but I know exactly what just happened. I know that feeling. We have to work better at controlling it. That's really what Jesus has called us to do. But dude, I get it. I make that mistake. I sin just like that constantly, but we just got to do something different there. We got to apologize often. Seek gospel opportunities. Engage readily. Apologize often. And lastly is model discipleship. Model discipleship. One of the things that I was really struck by growing up, my grandma, she died a few years back, but I remember whenever I would stay at her house, I would wake up in the morning and I would catch her reading her Bible. And she never once said, you need to read the Bible, but I just watched her do it. And I think we would do well to have our family catch us modeling discipleship. And it might be weird at first. You might be sitting there like reading your Bible, like this is awkward. This is weird, but there's no mistaking it. The Bible makes it very clear that we are as men to be men of the word, to be listening. For me, it's, it's for sure. We're going to have fun kid time, but we're also going to turn on worship music in the car. They're going to, they're going to listen to me, listen to sermons. They are going to watch me engage in the word. They're going to watch me wrestle with the truths of scripture to model discipleship. I remember being in youth ministry and one of the expectations I had with our leaders that always bugged me is I would, I would go to camps or I would go to retreats with other churches or even starting out in the, in the church that I was at. And the leaders, as soon as worship would start, they would go to the back and they would grab some food or they would go outside and they would talk while the kids would sing and the kids would engage in worship or, or they would go to the back of the room. And I would, I would tell them, like, guys, I want the kids to watch you worshiping. I want you to be in the middle of them. If worshiping is what kids do, then our kids will think it's a baby thing to do. If reading the Bible and engaging in worship and praying and all these things are what we're just going to teach our kids without modeling it for them, then we've rejected one of the key rules of discipleship. Discipleship is caught more than it's taught. As a dad, make no mistake. Your kids, the words that you say on like an amplified speaker, the words you say register at about a one. The things we do register at a 57,000. If I'm drinking a beer and telling you that it's bad to drink, Are you going to listen to what I say about drinking beer? No, you're going to watch what I'm doing. In the same way, if I tell you that praying is important, but I am not a prayer, if I tell you that studying is important, but I'm not a studier, if I tell you that serving mom is important, but I don't do it, if I tell you, but I don't do it, if I don't, if I don't let you catch me being a disciple, if you don't see it, then when I get older and you tell me it's important, 
in the back of my mind, I'm just going to think, well, why wasn't it important for you? Seek gospel tunities, engage readily, apologize often, and model discipleship. And it's going to feel weird at first. If you don't model discipleship, if you're not praying and reading and doing these things and getting caught doing them often, it's going to feel weird at first, maybe a little bit contrived and forced. But I promise you, it's better than thinking to yourself, well, I don't want to look fake, so I'm just not going to do it. It's like atrophy. It's like going to the gym. You have to develop the muscles to go, okay, this is part of my discipline here. But the Bible makes it really clear we are to be men of the word. And that's not one hour on a Sunday listening to a sermon. That should be supplemental to our personal life of walking with Jesus. Where you find a man engaged in the word of God, you are going to find a model of discipleship that translates to the rest of our family. Where can we, as Christ's ambassadors, model, display, and do the things that spiritual leadership It's not this super highbrow, have to always be taking level 400 Bible classes or making sure we have a daily sing song, sing along with our family and writing new music for the church. That's not what it means to be a spiritual leader of our household. We are to have the attitude of Christ and we are to practice the actions of Jesus. And if we're doing those things, we can look at that grade scale that God gives us of spiritual leadership and know that we're doing a good job. See you guys next time. Hey guys, as always, I hope that episode was helpful for you in falling more in love with Jesus and helping your family do the same. Two really practical things you can do today. Number one, sign up for our family leadership program. This is an intensive program to give you very practical steps, day-by-day steps, and how to point your family to Jesus. So if you're serious about this stuff, go to dadtire.com forward slash lead, sign up for that program. Also, we would love to see you and the tons of other guys who are going to be at our retreat this fall. In Arkansas, we'd love to have you be part of that. You can go to that or you can sign up for that by going to dadtire.com forward slash retreat. I love you guys. We'll see you next week.